certainly good to see each and every one who has come out this morning to honor and reverence God, to praise God, and of course at this time to open up the pages of the inspired Word of God as we seek to together look into it and try and increase our knowledge and our understanding so that we might be better equipped to go forth into the world and do the work that we have been called to do. We're going to begin this morning by reading a few verses from the book of Acts chapter 24, which will set the stage for the thoughts that we want to consider together. Acts chapter 24, beginning there in verse 12. We find here the apostle Paul, as he spoke on this occasion, he says, They neither found me in the temple disputing with anyone nor inciting the crowd, either in the synagogues or in the city, nor can they prove the things of which they now accuse me. But this I confess to you that according to the way, which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers." Believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets, I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and men. Of course, we have Paul here giving a defense of himself, but I want us to focus in on what he says concerning the church here in these few verses. You notice there, of course, he refers to the church as the way, which is a reference, of course, to what Jesus said there in John 14 and verse 6 about he is the way, the truth, the life. The church, we understand, is his spiritual body, his kingdom. But you notice that as he talks about the way that the church is spoken of in regards to those that had accused him falsely. He says they call it a sect. A term that we might use today instead of sect would be cult. I'm sure if you've been a member of the church for very long that as you have spoken with other people about your faith and you've tried to explain the things that you believe in and perhaps show people uh, given the nature of the discussion or the conversation, certain things from God's Word and explain certain things, that you probably heard the accusation concerning the Church of Christ, as we have that name on our sign out there. People will say, well, I think that uh, you guys sound a lot like a cult. Or people will point the finger and say, well, you just think that you're the only ones going to heaven. You think that you're the only ones that have discovered the right path or the actual understanding of truth. And of course, they say that in a negative sense. The popular idea, of course, today is that we just choose the church, so to speak, of our choice. And whatever sounds good, whatever makes the most sense to us is what will ultimately get us to where we want to go. But we want to consider this question. Is the church of Christ a cult? But before we really answer that question, I want us to clarify some things. I think it's important for us to make sure that when we are talking about the church of Christ, that we understand what we mean by that. First of all, we're not referring to a denomination. I remember younger and when I was back in high school and and of course there's been several times since then that similar things have unfolded but I remember as I would talk with people about where I assembled to worship and who I was affiliated with that as the understanding became clear that me and this other person were both Christians quote unquote they would say okay well yeah, I understand you're a Christian, but, but what are you? And I'd say, well, I'm, I'm a Christian. I, I don't really know what more to say about that. And they'd say, well, yeah, I know, but are you a, a Baptist? Are you a Presbyterian? Are you a Catholic? They were looking for some additional qualifier as to the term Christian. And as we look around the landscape today, we see how many different quote-unquote churches that exist 
even here in our community in Medina. And so when people see this building and they see us as we assemble on Sunday morning, they naturally assume, well, just like the Presbyterian Church or the Catholic Church or the Mormon Church or whatever, they also see as they drive down the road, they say, well, that just must be another denomination. But is the Church of Christ, is what we are striving to be here in this place, are we striving to be just another man-made denomination? Well, I would submit that that is not the case. When we talk about the Church of Christ, we're talking about the church as it's described in the pages of the New Testament. You think primarily there in the book of Acts as it recounts the history of the early church and talks about and explains to us how the church developed and began to grow. That is what we should all be striving to be a part of and to be a realization of in this place, wherever we would find ourselves. You know, in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4, of course, there Paul talks about there's one Lord, there's one faith. He also talks about there is one body. And the body, as we will see as we go through our lesson, more plainly with some other scriptures, the body is the church. There's one body of Christ. Are we a part of that? We should all be striving to be. Not just a member of some man-made group, but a member of that which Jesus died to establish. As you look at what Jesus did and the things that he spoke and the things that he prayed while he was here, over and over again he highlighted the fact that his will for us, and of course his will matched the Father's will, but his will is that we would all be unified in him. Not that we would be divided, and that's really the idea of what a denomination is. It's, it's division. It's differences. Here in John chapter 17, notice just a couple verses where Jesus is praying to the Father, and he's been speaking to God about specifically his disciples. But in verse 20 he says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they may all, notice, be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. And that's an interesting statement there, just at the end of verse 21. The unity was designed to declare that God was indeed with these individuals because of their unification. And so, is it really that hard to wrap our minds around the fact that a lot of people look at religion today and they say, well, I don't see God in that. Look at all the division. Look at all the differences. They can't even agree amongst themselves. We see how successful our adversary has been. One other verse on this particular point. Over here in the book of Philippians in chapter 1. You look there with me at verse 27. And Paul says, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast, notice, in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And so again, we see stressed the unification that we are to have. And so we are not striving to be just another denomination. We are striving to be the church that Christ established. We are referring to the body of the saved. As we said, that which Christ died on the cross to bring into existence. Over here in the book of Ephesians, there at the end of chapter 1, We find here described, and we had made reference to this a few moments ago, but here we have clarification about the connection between the body and the church. We see that they are one in the same. Verse 22 there says, He, that is God, put all things under Christ's feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, notice, which is his body, 
the fullness of him who fills all in all. Over here in chapter 5, as Paul is going through a discussion of marriage and husbands and wives and how that relationship is to look and ultimately trying to get us to understand that marriage is a reflection of the relationship between Christ and his church. But notice there in verse 23, it says, the husband is head of the wife as also Christ is head of the church. And notice he is savior of the body. And so those that are members of his church are saved by his blood. Back here in the book of Acts, you recall where the apostle is speaking to the elders from the congregation there in Ephesus. And there in verse 28, he says, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, Notice, which he purchased with his own blood. And so if the church was important enough for Jesus to die on a cross to establish it, then we ought to take very seriously the obligation to keep it as it was intended to be. Over here in Acts chapter 2, some verses that I'm sure we are all familiar with. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 40 after Peter has explained the process through which uh, men can come out of their sins and be saved by repenting, being baptized in the name of Christ. Verse 40 says, With many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. And those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And at the tail end of verse 47 there, as you lead into chapter 3, you notice that The Lord was the one that was adding to the church daily those who were being saved. And so you go to certain of these denominations and say, well, I want to be a member of your group. And what happens? Well, they have to meet and they have to have meetings and say, well, does he meet certain requirements? And and men decide your fate as it pertains to your membership, right? But we see here that the church that is described in the Bible, who does the adding? The Lord does. As individuals meet the requirements set forth for uh, turning from sin and being reborn, being recreated, then the Lord adds them to his church. We refer to those who are simply called Christians and adhere to the doctrine of Christ. You turn a few pages over there in the book of Acts to chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. Uh, and look there at verse 26. And really we want to focus in on the last sentence there of that particular verse. But it says the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. You know, it's interesting. As people, you talk with people about their identity as it pertains to spiritual things. You know, they want to call themselves, like we said earlier, well, I'm a Baptist. I'm a Presbyterian. I'm not trying to pick on any of those groups. Um, But what does the Bible teach about what we call ourselves? We're we're just Christians. No need to further qualify that. Uh, Being a Christian and that alone is is something we should should strive for. In 2 John, you turn back there for a moment. We have here the warning about wandering from the simple teaching that we have been given, the teaching of Christ, there in 2 John and verse 9, it says, whoever transgresses, the idea is going beyond, and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ, what are we told? That individual does not have God. However, he who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. And so we don't need any creed books. We don't need any further revelations. We have the complete revelation. As Peter wrote there in 2 Peter 1 and verse 3, we've been given all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so are we going to abide in that and that alone? Or are we going to wander astray and become something foreign to what the Bible portrays as the church. 
And finally, I think it's important for us to bring out that we acknowledge that God's Word describes Christ's church using a variety of titles. It's not that if we had the church of the living God on the sign that that would be unscriptural because the Scriptures use that very description of the church. But as we think about what is the most succinct way to describe this group based upon the Scriptures, well, it's the church that belongs to Christ. He is the head of the body, as we read a few moments ago. And so, of course, in Romans 16 16, we, we find that very description given, the churches of Christ, referencing, of course, various congregations of the church. 1 Timothy 3.15 uses the description that uh, we referenced a moment, a moment ago there, the church of the living God. Acts chapter 24 and verse 14, interestingly enough, just says the way. And that's what we saw Paul referencing it as earlier there in the passage that we read at the beginning of the lesson. And, uh, you know, interestingly enough, more times than not, as we read about the body of Christ in the scriptures, it's not a title such as those, but actually it's just called the church. Acts 2 and verse 47, which we read earlier. The Lord added to the church. And so when we say church of Christ, this is what we're trying to describe here. Not a denomination, but rather the church as it's described in the pages of the, of the Bible. And that's a hard concept for many today to, to really come to terms with because of the nature of the way things are. But nonetheless, we, we needed to define that before we could really get into answering this additional question. And the main question that we want to consider this morning, is the Church of Christ a cult? Is it some kind of, you know, you think about a cult and you think about perhaps that group that some years ago their leader uh, convinced them all that there was this spaceship hiding behind a comet. And if they would all kill themselves and commit suicide, mass suicide, then their spirits, as that comet came near Earth, would be transferred up to the mothership, more or less. And, of course, the mothership was supposedly God, as described in the Scriptures. And so, you know, we think about crazy things like that, and we think, well, we don't want to be involved with anything like that. But yet, some people look at us and they say, well, you're the same thing. You're, you're a cult like those people were and perhaps are a cult even today. But if you look up the definition of that word in the dictionary, you'll find that it's defined as a small religious group that is not part of a larger and more accepted religion that has beliefs regarded by many people as extreme or dangerous. Cults typically have a human leader who is self-appointed. You think about cults down through history and it's some, some man, one person generally, who is very charismatic, very, uh, very well-spoken, and is able to convince people to go along with whatever ideas he has come up with. Cults typically are spoken of as possessing some kind of a, a secret knowledge. Well, you can only attain uh, this particular knowledge or this particular understanding if you become a part of our secret society or you go through the, the process of being inducted into our group and then you will, you will have this revealed and your mind will be free and, and these types of ideas. And often we we see that these cults will use psychological coercion to recruit and indoctrinate and also retain its membership. And so they have perhaps a particular a script that they are to follow, and that script is designed to uh, lead people through a particular thought process, and maybe we think about the, the term brainwashing, uh, but basically that is the idea. Cults will use these kinds of psychological techniques to convince people to go along and buy in and then continue to buy in to these particular ideas that they are perpetuating. And so does that describe what we have in the New Testament, what we are striving to be here in this place? Well, as you may have guessed, 
The answer to this question that I would put forward to, uh, to you this morning is the Church of Christ is not a cult. But of course we need to explain that. Well, why not? Well, the Church of Christ is not a cult and we're going to look at various points here based upon the definition that we have just noted. But first of all, we do not have a human leader. Now, that's interesting. Now, Jesus Christ certainly was a man. He was flesh and bone like you and I are here, to, here today. But he was so much more than that. And of course, he proved that and demonstrated that through various signs, ultimately, of course, in his resurrection from the dead. I'd like us to notice a couple passages. In Colossians chapter 1, first of all, Colossians chapter 1, and you start there in verse 15, we read, He, that is Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, things that are visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things consist. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. And so... Here is the head of the church, the body that we are talking about this morning. Not a human being, merely, is he? But rather, he is indeed the Son of God. He is God, possesses the qualities of God, part of the Godhead, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And if you come back here to the book of Matthew, and you look there at chapter 16, we Recall how that Peter, of course, confessed this very fact as he was prompted by Christ, well, who do men say that I am? Who am I? Am I just a man? Am I just a guy with good ideas who happens to be a good teacher and is persuasive and able to get people to follow after him? Well, Matthew chapter 16, we'll look at verse 16, beginning. It says, Simon Peter answered and said, again in response to this question, he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answers him in verse 17, Blessed are you, Simon, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say that to you, uh, to you that you are Peter, and on this rock, this solid confession, this truth that you have uttered, I will establish or build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. My death is not going to prevent the church from being established because I am going to rise again. And you know, we could quickly go over to the book of Romans there in uh, chapter 1 as Paul introduces that uh, most famous of letters to the Romans. And he talks about there how that ultimately Christ confirmed himself as being indeed the Son of God through his resurrection from the dead. And so we do not have a, a human leader we have a leader who surpasses humanity, who created humanity, the very Son of God. We do not claim to have special revelation. In other words, we don't have secret books or secret knowledge that you can only understand if you join us, if you join our ranks, so to speak. But rather, we understand that the gospel is open and available to all men everywhere and is intended for all men everywhere. Because God's will, of course, is that all men would be saved by coming to a knowledge of the truth. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, we're familiar there, where Paul declares that he's not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek, to everyone who believes in it. There in Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 and verse 18. If you uh, 
look at the overall context here, of course, uh, Paul is talking about the nation of Israel and how Israel, despite having heard the gospel, had regardless rejected the gospel. And so different questions are being asked and then likewise answered by the apostle here. But in verse 18, he asked the question, but I say, have they not heard? Perhaps they've not obeyed the gospel because they haven't heard the gospel. But notice what he says. Yes, indeed, they have heard. He says, their sound has gone out to all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In other words, here we have indicated that that commission that was given by Christ himself before he ascended to the Father to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature had indeed been fulfilled. That's what the apostles did. And so it wasn't some kind of knowledge that was retained and hidden. No, it was declared to all the world that men might be saved by obeying it. Over here in Acts chapter 10, you recall that Cornelius and his household, that Peter came to them there to preach to them the gospel. And this was significant, of course, because this was the first Gentile household to receive the gospel and likewise obey it for salvation and uh, indicating, of course, that the Gentiles were likewise heirs of salvation uh, in addition to the Jews. But you notice what Peter says there in verse 34. He opens his mouth and he says, In truth I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. And so God is not trying to keep his gospel or his knowledge secret or retained to only a particular group of people, but rather wants it to be declared to the entire world. As we think about the means through which we seek to bring people to Christ, it's not about just enhancing our numbers for the sake of having a large group and so we can boast in that and say, well, look how great of a group we have become. No, it's about bringing people to Christ so that they might have their sins washed away. Well, how do we go about doing that? Well, we appeal to reason, don't we? Based not upon our own ideas or our own wisdom, but rather we appeal to the Scriptures. We don't use pressure or manipulation or control tactics, but members are encouraged to study and also to test what is being taught. I'm sure that it has been declared from this pulpit many times. Look and follow along in your Bibles. And if something is is declared up here that is not in alignment with what God has said, then come tell me. We don't want to teach anything or declare anything to be true that is not in accordance with God's Word. It's not in accordance with what we can point to and, and read right before our eyes in the the pages of inspiration. You recall there in Acts chapter 17 and verse 11 that those in Berea were commended. They were called more noble than their brethren in Thessalonica because they heard the message that Paul was preaching, but then they also searched the scriptures to ascertain whether or not the message lined up with what God had revealed. You see, the Bible itself encourages its readers to not just take things at face value, not just to take things because, well, the speaker just spoke so well and just made it sound so appealing and wonderful. No, what does the Bible actually say? We're encouraged to search the Scriptures and to test the things that are taught to make sure that they are indeed what God has declared. 2 Timothy 2.15, we're told to study, as the King James renders it. Uh, The other translations might render that to be diligent, but the idea is that we would take the Word of God and spend time in the Word of God so that we might be indeed approved before Him. Workers that do not need to be ashamed. But we have to spend time with what God has revealed. Over here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. You look there at verse 21. The encouragement is to test 
not most things or some things or only things that don't come from certain individuals who are speaking, but no, test all things. Test all things and then hold fast to what is good. If you can establish it in the Word of God, then you hold fast to it. Similar thing is declared to us over here in the book of 1 John, chapter 4. You look at verse 1. He says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And so you see how the Bible itself declares that we should not just take men's word for anything, but rather we are to test all things using the scriptures to see whether or not the truth is being declared. While we are not conformed to this world, we do not isolate ourselves from society either. You know, you think about a cult and generally uh, they're kind of off over here or they have their little temple up here on the mountain and they kind of keep to themselves and they're very secret. But that is not how the church is described and that is not how the church is intended by God to be. We don't conform to the world, but yet we are to be very much present in this world so that we might be the light of the world, declaring the truth of God. Over here in John chapter 17, once again, we were there a little earlier. Again, as Christ prays to the Father here on this occasion, you notice verses 14 and 15, he says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. But notice what he says in verse 15, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. The idea is not that we should remove ourselves. You know, you hear about people saying, well, I'm just going to go live up on the mountain by myself and not interact with anybody and then I don't have to deal with any of this stuff that's going on. I don't have any of this negative influence. But you see, that defeats the whole purpose of what we're called to be. Because if we keep the knowledge just retained to ourselves, then we're not really fulfilling the mission that we've been called to. Back here in Matthew chapter 5, and we'd reference this, of course, and if we're not familiar with the passage itself, we've undoubtedly probably heard the phrase used at one time or another, the idea of being the light of the world, the salt of the earth. But notice there beginning in verse 14, Jesus says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and then put it under a basket, but rather they put it on a lampstand and it will give light to all who are in the house. And so let your light so shine before men that they might see your good works, not to glorify you, but that they ultimately would come to glorify your Father, as he says there, who is in heaven. We are zealous, yes, but we are not antagonistic. We don't go around and take our Bibles and say, hey, and smack people across the head and say, now you do things our way, or we're going to keep smacking you across the head. No, we, we are gentle, aren't we? That's the way we're called to be. Now there are times, of course, as you think about Christ and his interaction with different ones, that he was rather harsh in the, the way that he spoke. And perhaps there are times when we need to, to follow that example as well. But regardless in a general sense, as we present the gospel to others, we are called to do so in a gentle fashion. First of all, I would like us to pop back here to the book of Titus for just a moment as we think about this idea of being zealous for God. Certainly we are called to be of that mindset, to be passionate about that which God has revealed and that which has saved us as we have rendered obedience to it. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 says, The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, notice who are zealous for good works. Over here in Romans chapter 12. You look there at verse 18. And what are we called to be in relation to 
those perhaps who are outside of the body of Christ. If it is possible, Paul says, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Now sometimes peace is made impossible, not because of us, but because of what other people are doing. But as much as it depends on you, he says, you live peaceably with others. In Galatians chapter 6, in verse 10, Therefore, he says, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially those who are of the household of faith. And so we are called to be good and gentle to all men. Sometimes we are accused as we relate the gospel, and we're talking about the, the straight and narrow path, that there's one way to God, that there's one body. It sounds rather narrow-minded to people, and they get to thinking, well, you just think you're better than me. You think that you are so far superior to me. But we need to make very plain and very clear this morning and at all times that we're not thinking we're better than anybody. We acknowledge readily that we are sinners who by the grace of God have been saved from our sins. And that is our motivation then for wanting to reach out to other people. So that they likewise might be free from their sins. Romans 3 verse 23 of course declares that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. We do believe that God means what he says though. When God says that the way is narrow that leads to life. And broad is the way that leads to destruction. We believe that. And as you think about the nature of truth just for a minute. Truth is narrow, isn't it? Because truth is truth. There, there's one truth, right? You think about mathematics. Two plus two equals four. That, that's just the way it is. But yet as you think about religious things, in the sense of mathematics, you have people over here that say two plus two equals five, and people over here that say two plus two equals three. Because that sounds better to us, or that makes more sense to me. But does that change the truth? Well, no. Two plus two is still four. What is right is still right because God has said it's right. And so the question is, will we be humble enough to submit to God? Or will we persist in having itching ears and seeking to have that itch scratched by those that would say what we want them to say? God wants all men to be saved. And we absolutely share that sentiment. And that is, as we've said, our motivation to be in the world and shining the light of Christ into the world. Just a few more quick uh, verses here on this particular point. In 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4. <clears throat> There is it speaking concerning God, our Savior, as he's described there in the end of verse 3. It says, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God's will is that none would be lost. Second Peter chapter 3, look there at verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. The promise of the end of time and the final judgment. It's not that... That hasn't happened yet because God forgot. Oh yeah, I, I did say I was going to do that. But why? Why has the end not yet come? Well, he is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And could it be made any more plain than the verse that is quoted more than any other? John chapter 3 and verse 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so as we look at the church in the pages of inspiration, the church that we here in this place are striving to be, what is the conclusion that we draw in light of the question that has been asked? Well, it is a resounding no. We are not a cult, but we are simply trying to be the body of, of the saved, the body of Christ, so that we might reach 
mankind with the message of salvation that is declared in the pages of Scripture, that they might come out of their sins and have hope of eternal life someday. We're going to conclude by noticing a passage in Acts chapter 28. We'll read here beginning in verse 21. They said to him there, We neither received letters from Judea concerning you, nor have any of the brethren who came reported or spoken any evil of you. This is certain of the Jews that are are communicating with Paul at this time. But, they go on to say, We desire to hear from you what you think. For concerning this sect, now they're referencing, of course, again, the church. Concerning this sect, concerning this cult, we know that it is spoken against everywhere. We hear nothing but negative things about it. But we want to hear your opinion. We want to hear what you have to say. And so when they had appointed him a day, many came to him at his lodging, to whom he explained and solemnly testified of the kingdom of God persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets from morning until evening. And some were persuaded by the things which were spoken, and some disbelieved. Of course, that will continue to be the case as we go forth in following the footsteps of Paul, following the footsteps of Christ, who, of course, Paul was following in the footsteps of himself. As we declare this message, some will be persuaded, some will not. But we need to be busy in declaring it and explaining to people that we're not a cult, but rather we're trying to be what God, through his son, established as a vessel for salvation. So I hope that these these things have been helpful to you this morning and will be helpful as you go forward and interact with different ones and have conversations about the word of God and spiritual things that you might be able to more adequately explain yourself and give a defense of the faith and the hope that is in you. This morning, if there would be anyone here who has not obeyed the gospel, or perhaps you are a Christian and you have wandered astray, or you need prayers of encouragement at this time, we would ask that you would make those things known. Uh, We're going to sing this song of invitation, as we have dubbed it. And if you have that need, we would ask that you would make your way up to the front of the auditorium so that we might assist you. Please do that as we stand and sing together.